Welcome to the CBS Eye on Money show. It is Thursday, May 5th, and we are here to try to help take the mystery out of your financial life. And when I say we, I am meaning me. I am Jill Schlesinger, CBS News business analyst and a certified financial planner. And the other part of that we is Mark Talercio, who is the co-host of this program, executive producer of my life, and also a certified financial planner. Good morning, Mark. Buongiorno. And he's also loves to sport a little Italian. Weren't you taking Italian lessons or, or language course or something at some point? Yeah, yeah, I did that for a while. What happened? I, you know, uh, life, life happened. Do you know how to speak Italian fluently? No, no, fluently, no, but enough to get by, yes. You can, you can navigate a restaurant easily. Can you talk to someone in the street? Do you feel like you could do that? I could ask for directions, yeah. Okay. And you could understand it, which is more important. One thing to ask. <laughs> the other part is getting to actually say, oh, okay, that's what you said? Okay, good. I've told I've told Amanda recently that once Theo is kind of, you know, in school, mm-hmm. Monday through Friday doing his thing, that the, my, my next goal in life is to learn a language fluently. Well, how about the one that both your spouse, you your in-laws, that. and your son speak? Let's start with that. Why are you so reluctant? Uh, I'm not reluctant. You are a little uh, bit. You are reluctant. It's it's, it's not an easy language to learn. Well, that makes it, listen, you became a certified financial planner certificate. That was not easy. You decided you were going to do it and you did it and you didn't need it. In other words, you don't need to learn how to speak Mandarin, but if you decide to do it, it would be similar to the, to the CFP. It's something that you are happy that you have done, but you didn't need to do it. What do you think? I, I, I was thinking about diving deep into either Italian, mm-hmm. which which is very doable. For I me know, at this or point, French, or or French, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and just just let the rest of my family talk behind my back without me understanding. All right, fair enough, fair enough. All right, well, um, we'll see how this all goes. Now, are you looking to do something different in your life? If you are, it may have a financial aspect to it. It doesn't mean everything is. Like taking a language doesn't exactly have a financial aspect, but so many of our life decisions have something to do with money. And that is why we have created the shows that we have created. This program, Eye on Money, our sister podcast, which is called Jill on Money. We also have a terrestrial radio show called Jill on Money. And if you'd like to subscribe or get all the information on all the stuff that we put out on audio, go to our website, jillonmoney.com. While you're there, you can check out videos because every so often I let them gussy me up for television. And you can also read the blog. And um, the blog, we spend some time really trying to give you information that will help you either make sense of the financial news and economic news, and there is plenty of that lately, or maybe just to help you. If you've got a financial question while you're on the website, just click the Contact Us button and we'll get your note. And if you want to come on the program, there's a little checkbox at the end of the form that says, would you be willing to come on the air with us? And if you say yes, then we get you on the air. When I say we, Mark, because Mark does all the work. Today, we are talking to Anthony from Arkansas. Hello, Anthony. How are you? What can we do to help you out today? Doing well. Thank you for having me. Of course. What's going on? So I have a question about an investment that I made a little less than a year and a half ago. Okay. My wife and I upgraded to a new home in October 2020. Mm-hmm. And after paying everything and going through this and that, we netted about $20,000 from hmm. the sale of our formal home. Okay. And so, of course, the question is, what do you do with this $20,000? Okay. I had a previous conversation with my former financial advisor, basically asking, hey, I've got savings that's not doing anything. What do I do with it? Mm-hmm. And he recommended this bond fund, specifically the PGIM total return bond. So this is a bond fund that is, it seems fine. It doesn't seem like terrible, good, bad. It's a general, as you know, total return bond fund. It looks like it's, it is really more in the intermediate term in terms of the duration It also looks like, I don't know what share class you bought, but this is, when you said you had a financial advisor, this is uh, something that you paid for through a commission. Is that right? 
there was a, I want to say 3.25% front load on it. Yep. That and makes I'm, sense. And I'm pretty sure that some portion of that front load went to the advisor. Now, even though I went ahead and followed his advice, and okay. I followed his advice because in this area, he was far more knowledgeable than I was. Mm-hmm. I'm investing through an E-Trade account. When Before I invested, I just did a quick search and compared that fund to a couple of others. Mm-hmm. I sent him an email and said, hey, I did a little bit of research on my own. What do you think of these two as alternates? Mm. And the response I got was something along the lines, and of course I'm paraphrasing, I get paid to do this research and Uh-oh. you know things of that nature. I recognize that he's more knowledgeable than I am, but at the same time, it was still a, a very surprising response to what up to that point had always been a positive and friendly relationship. Now, that being said, I still took his, his advice. I still invested the $20,000 into that fund. I refer to this money as, you know, not anything I'm going to need in the short term, but if I were to have to completely wipe out all of everything in my checking account and my savings account, this would be the next money that I would go to for whatever major Mm. emergency had hit. So we're not talking about, we're not talking about money that I'm going to need immediately. Well, so you still own the fund, yeah? I I still own the fund. And ultimately, my question is, do I keep it? Is it, you know, is it worth keeping? Is it good? Or should I just say, look, I've paid the 3.25. It's there. And just pull it out and start putting that money in other places. You still with the guy? Uh, no. I, in it's so fact, funny because I was at that so I'm like, did we break up or not? <laughs> well, 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 well here's, here's the thing, Jill. The only real service that I was using him for was to store my IRA and my Roth. And first of all, I've got another option, which is even better than going through him. But second, it was one of those things where I was just going to him on an annual basis for a check-in the value in that relationship wasn't there compared to where it was when I first engaged with them. It made sense to discontinue that relationship. Okay. Are you freaked out because this fund lost money last year or are you freaked out because you're worried that it costs too much? Like where, where is your, where is the pain point right now? Well, it's actually a combination of both of the things that you mentioned. My knowledge of the stock market is, enough to make me dangerous, if that's understandable. Sure. Um, By no means an expert, but I've got no problem going into this account that I have and buying and selling an ETF whenever I feel comfortable or not comfortable. Mm -hmm. Bonds are a completely different story. And when I invested in this fund, my thinking was, for the large part, this thing is going to go nowhere other than collecting the monthly dividend. And I was happy with that because again, Mm -hmm. the primary purpose of this was just a place for it to be long-term storage, you know, money I'm not going to need immediately, but certainly something that I want to collect more than a fraction of a percent on. It's tough. Okay. Because if you want to have bond exposure, this is not a bad fund. I mean, you already paid for it. It's expensive. So it's almost like, eh, you have it. You know, it may invest in some sketchier stuff like high yield bonds, but that doesn't, I mean, most of the credit quality is actually decent here. You know, if you hold on for for the long term and you reinvest the dividends as things, you know, I think it's going to be okay. But if you're saying, oh my God, this is really is my emergency reserve fund, then it's not okay. But if you're saying it's part of a long term, even if it's intermediate term, it's an intermediate term portfolio. It's non-retirement. It's part of my E-Trade account. I'm putting money in the stock market over time, you know, in 10 years, maybe we'll tap this for something else. Yeah. Okay. Maybe. Right. Then I'm fine with it, but I'm not really in the mood to like, have you blow out of something. It's a decently ranked and reviewed fund. I don't have any beef with the fund itself. I just have a beef with the fact that you paid a ton of money for it, but now that you own it, you know, I, I'm not sure it makes a ton of sense for you 
to necessarily get out of it. I mean, I think that you could make this part of a larger portfolio. You know, bonds actually do protect you on the downside. Having this one lump sum $20,000 that you had from the sale of your home put into this one fund would not necessarily have been my choice. But if you feel like you're ready to allocate and you want it to be a little bit riskier and you want to put some of the money to work, fine. And if you want to reduce the expense ratio by going into a bond index fund and reduce the cost, fine. But if this is any part of this is an emergency reserve fund, I think we have to get it into boring accounts. I really do. And isn't that annoying that I say that? But, you know, when we have a an emergency, we want to make sure that you actually can get the money and not have any fluctuation in price. The good news here is that I'm not expecting this to be my emergency fund unless the emergency is catastrophic. Okay. So then, Mark, should we move it at this point or not? What do you think? Do you have a bond position in your retirement account through work? My um, retirement account at work is pretty diversified, so I probably do have some bond positions there, but that's my retirement account. And I just, I just think about that completely separately. But what is it? Just tell us what's the, what is the retirement account? What does the allocation look like? I want to say it's about 70 in stocks and 30 in a combination Mm -hmm. of bonds, real estate and other safer stuff. So in this account, in this E-Trade account, what would you ideally want your allocation to be if you were starting from scratch this minute? Not too aggressive, but certainly on the more aggressive side, because again, I'm not looking to tap into this money anytime soon. Mark, what do you want to do with this? I I mean, look, the way my mind works is I kind of see all these accounts together as one big portfolio. That's that's how my mind works. So I I would have your bond allocation in your retirement account at work. I I would just probably blow out of this bond that you have in E-Trade and just do what you want to do with it with your stock index funds. That's what I would do. But I I don't know. It doesn't sound like that's really what you want to do. Yeah, I feel the same way. I mean, I just want you to be, it's easy to get fall into this trap of like the buckets, but like, I think that if you, what I would say is this, if you say that I'm 70, 30 in my retirement account, and this is money that I'd like, it's outside of retirement account, it may need be necessary for catastrophic purposes. And, you know, then naturally I would have you put money into a less aggressive portfolio because it's, you could tap this money before you tapped your retirement account, Right. So wouldn't I be more like a 50-50 or at least a 60-40 investor in this account? I think that that's that's okay. If you want to make it more efficient, you do all index funds, you get rid of this fund. Did you lose money on this fund? Net net. I mean like if you, from I mean, what I mean is to say if you sold it right now, would we have a capital gain or a capital loss? We would definitely have a cap- a loss. Oh, um, sell it then because I bet you've got gains somewhere else. And you can take a loss up to th- Did you lose more than $3,000 on it? Um, no, I'm, I'm looking at it right now. I went in at 20 and that's before the load and everything, obviously. Yep. And it's currently at 18.7 and that's, and I've been reinvesting the dividends the entire time. Okay. So you have, what you do have, have you filed your taxes yet? I have not. Okay. So I don't know if you have gains from this year or not, but when you file your, if you sell this right now, The nice thing is that, and if you have other stuff in your account that you're like, you know what, let me just start fresh with whatever you have. You could literally sell everything right now. You could have gains that are washed with losses, or you could just sell this loser. You could just say, I'm going to sell this because I'll take a loss and I can deduct up to $3,000 of losses on my income taxes for the tax year 2022. And you could just redeploy it in other assets. And I think that that might make sense. Look, I think when you have a brokerage account, it's like your supplemental retirement account. You're going through this process. You've, you know, you've done the right thing in terms of like, all right, I'm putting money in my retirement plan. I'm being a good doobie. This account should be, I think, less risky than a retirement account because you could, and not you will, but you could tap it before the other one. So I would be fine if you sold this fund. There's two ways to look at it. One is like, I already sunk the cost. But you know what? The annual expense ratio is high enough that I could be on board with you selling it, taking the loss, taking the money out. Now start fresh. Now what do I want my allocation to be? If it's 70-30, fine. If it's 60-40, fine. If it's 50-50, fine. So 
number one, you know how we always play this game, right? We say, make sure you have an adequate emergency reserve fund. So if you sell this and you feel like, eh, I really only have two months of expenses that socked away, no, then we've got to make sure that some of this is put into the emergency reserve. Number two, do I have any outstanding debt? Now, I'm not talking about mortgage debt. Are there any credit cards or student loans that are floating around for you? No credit card. The only thing is that we just replaced my wife's car. So we have a car note, but that car note's going to be at 1.9%. Oh, you got a car. How lucky for you. You actually found <laughs> one. Um, and then you're maxing out the retirement account. So then this money can really be your supplemental retirement, you know? And I mean, how do you feel about the risk level in this portfolio being slightly different than that? I mean, like you really have to come clean with yourself. Is it going to make you nutty? to see this gyrate as much as your retirement account might? And also, what are you willing to do in terms of just sort of securing what is this this account to give you some comfort? Fluctuation in the retirement account doesn't bother me. And fluctuation even in this account doesn't bother me that much either. It was Mm -hmm. more to do with, you know, having, you know, putting that entire... $20,000 $20,000 into this fund that I was a little iffy on. Okay. And I was, honest, I was also just worried about that whole sunk cost fallacy. Mm-hmm. You know, the idea that I've already paid that huge load up front and I'm looking at a fund that, you know, just due to the bond markets hasn't been as nice as I thought it was going to be. Mm-hmm. And so it was one of those, do I do I just ride it out like you would do a normal stock position? Or was this just such a bad idea from the get that- It's not that you- such a bad idea, but I think that it should be part of a larger strategy. Sometimes like parts of your portfolio zig and other parts zag. And bonds are going to be dicey in the next couple of years, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't own them. That's the other piece of this. I want to be crystal clear with everyone listening that just because something goes down in value, we don't sell it. That's not the reason to sell. You have to have an overall game plan. And I think this can work in a game plan, but I would like to reduce the cost. I'll take the capital loss and let's move on. If you, like Anthony, have one little thorn in your side in your portfolio, one little bit that's making you nutty, then give us a holler. Just go to jillonmoney.com, click the contact us button. And we would be delighted to help you out. Just give us lots of details. And you can follow this broadcast, Eye on Money, wherever you get your podcast. Do check out our sister broadcast, which is called Jill on Money. You'll find all that information right on the JillOnMoney.com website. So, oh, by the way, while you're on the website, don't forget to sign up for the free weekly newsletter. It's free every single week. Uh, We drop episodes of this podcast every Tuesday and Thursday. We are distributed by the fine folks at CBS. Mark Talercio is the best co-host, the best executive producer of all time. Try to do something nice for someone else today. And remember, our mantra is curiosity, compassion, community. Thank you so much for listening. And we'll talk to you next week. 